There's a sutta that lists ten reflections that a person gone forth should reflect on often, every day. And one of them is katambhuta samme ratendiva vittibharanti. What am I becoming as days and nights fly past? Or in the Thai translation, which would be, days and nights fly past, fly past, what am I doing right now? One afternoon, a John Fu posed that question. He said, suppose the Buddha were in front of you and asked you that question, how would you answer? I happened to be sitting at the time, so I told him, well, I tell him I'm sitting. He says, that's not a good answer at all. It's not just a question of being alert. What qualities are you developing as time passes? Because you can't bring time back. But you can accumulate good qualities. If you're not developing good qualities, it's a double loss. The time is gone. And even if you think you're treading water, there's a downward slope. It's like that hill near Mount Lassen. It's made out of little bits of lava. And you can walk up the hill. It's fairly steep. And every now and then you stop to rest and you realize that as you're resting, you're sliding down. That's the way it is with time. So what can you do to make sure that you're still climbing and climbing? There's another place where the Buddha lists six qualities that you should look for in yourself, what he calls having a sense of yourself. The first quality is conviction. Is your conviction in the path growing? You know by looking at your virtue, which is another quality. Are you strict with yourself with the precepts, or do you find yourself getting lax about little things? This is especially relevant for the monks. We have lots of little precepts. And sometimes it's easy to say, oh, it's a little one, doesn't matter. But as a John Mun told a John Fuang one time, when a John Fuang was young, people don't get big logs in their eyes, or it's very rare. But they can get sawdust in their eyes, and it can blind them. In other words, it's very rare that we would break one of the big precepts, but it's very easy to break the little ones. And as one gets broken, another gets broken. And it gets easy to break another one. So you have to be convinced that we're here to work on our precepts, work on our concentration, work on our discernment. All that energy that goes into that is well spent. Now the quality you look for yourself is learning. We have the opportunity to learn more about the Dhamma. Especially now with the internet, you can get all kinds of suttas, read lots about the Vinaya. Are you taking advantage of that? We've got all these suttas in translation. We've got the works of the Ajans in the translation. If you're going to spend some time reading, read that. Think about it. And think about what the Buddha said. When you're listening to Dharma talk, how do you listen? You listen attentively, single-mindedly. Give it your full attention. And if there's anything of value, try to memorize it. And as you memorize it, you think it over. See how it fits in with what you've learned so far. Because when you see that it fits, that's when you become more willing to practice it. So you don't just read, read, read. You read and you think. You think and you mull it over. Until you feel inspired to practice. Then you can put, put the book down. Go sit and meditate. Go do walking meditation. Because that's the whole purpose of the reading, is to inspire you to practice. 
and to give you some insight on what you can do as you practice. I found in my own practice that there were times when I didn't want to read anything at all. I just wanted to practice. And then I'd come up against a problem, and it was the problem was often very ill-defined. I just knew that something was wrong, something didn't seem to make sense. And so I'd read what I could. We didn't have much back in those days. There were very few books by the Forest of Johns, almost nothing in terms of sutra translations. So for me it meant, often it meant going back and reading a John Lee again and again. And his books are especially good in the fact that you read them now, put them down in your practice, come back to them in a few months and you'll see other things that you didn't see before. And when you've reached a point where you feel inspired to practice, okay, put the books down. Come back to them again when you need them. It's an ongoing dialogue between the Dhamma that's been written down and your practice. That's the ideal way to read. That's the ideal way to learn. The next quality to look for yourself is generosity. How generous are you with your time? We all have our chores here at the monastery, and sometimes there's a sense that each of us feels that we're pulling more than other people are. And in some cases it's true, in some cases it's not. But even if you're pulling more, why let your generosity be measured by other people's generosity? We have a little extra energy. There are lots of little things we can do to help one another. And it creates a better atmosphere in the community. If you see generosity not as an imposition, but as an opportunity. The fact that something is not being done, you see that it can be done. You have the energy and the time, you do it. The feeling that comes from that is much better than having been assigned that particular task. And you realize you live in a community where things aren't done voluntarily. It makes it a different kind of community, a different kind of atmosphere. And as the Buddha said, it's one of the bases for having the group get along peacefully, with a sense of friendliness. When you have that kind of atmosphere, it's a lot easier to practice, a lot easier to get the mind settled in concentration with a sense of well-being. The fifth quality of the Buddha, as you look for, is discernment. To what extent do you see that you're creating suffering that you don't have to? That's the big question. When the Buddha set out the Four Noble Truths, he wasn't simply setting out four interesting facts about an interesting topic, suffering and stress. He was pointing out the fact that this is the big issue in life, the suffering and stress that we're causing ourselves that we don't have to, and the fact that we're causing it doesn't mean that we're stuck there, because we also have the qualities within ourselves, or the potentials within ourselves. And we can learn that we don't have to do that, learn how not to do that. And as you pointed out, once you take care of that suffering, then there's nothing to weigh down the mind. But before you get to that ultimate stage, you have to look for the little ways in which you're creating yourself suffering, the way you talk to yourself, the thoughts that you latch onto. To what extent are you dwelling in the past? It's very easy during a lockdown like this. You find yourself spending more and more time with yourself, with fewer and fewer opportunities for doing other things to distract yourself. 
start digging up old issues. Remember, those days and nights have flown past. And in some cases, it's just as well they've flown past. If you can learn a lesson from what mistakes you made, okay, learn the lesson and then move on, because time is moving on. And you don't want to waste it right now. Because you do have this opportunity to develop these good qualities. The last quality, patipana, can be translated as quick-wittedness or ingenuity. Those first five qualities are not only, not only the qualities the Buddha has you look for in yourself day after day. They're also the qualities that can make you a deva. In fact, you reflect on that and you realize that you have some goodness to you. That should be uplifting. But then we move on to bhatipana, quick-wittedness, ingenuity. This is where you go beyond, where you learn to look not only at your defilements, but to turn around and look at who's doing the looking. We had a monk from Bangkok visit us one time, and one evening he was sitting on the porch of a John Fung's hut. And the sun was particularly golden as it was about to set. The light was cast across the valley. He commented, this, this place is really quite beautiful. And John Fung immediately said, who's saying that it's beautiful? Look at that. In other words, keep looking back at your mind. This is when you're quick-witted. You turn and look at the mind, see what it's doing. It's all too easy to get into a state of mind and then be blinded by the state that you're in. You take on a point of view and not realize what you're doing. Always look at what you're doing. Have that reflective quality and look for patterns. That's the other part of ingenuity. Aristotle defined intelligence as the ability to see connections that no one else has pointed out to you. That means, on the one hand, seeing differences, which is what discernment is about, but also seeing patterns. So what you've learned in one skill, you can apply to the skill of the mind. This is why the Johns, and John Lee in particular, were so good at analogies. analogies for the skilled mind and analogies for the foolish mind, because they'd seen those patterns in themselves and were able to use those patterns to teach themselves. This is where you make the Dharma your own. You become not just a Dharma consumer, but a Dharma producer. Of course, the first person to consume your Dharma should be you. You should be the one who's benefiting. Maybe someday other people can benefit from your Dharma production. But this is what you want to become, someone who can produce the Dharma whenever it's needed, because we're not here just to memorize the Buddha's words and worship the Buddha's words. We're here to apply them to our own problem of suffering, and that means we have to learn how to adjust them to our problems. See where he sets forth riddles in his teachings, in other words, poses questions and doesn't answer them. You see him doing that every now and then. He'll say something to the monks and then get up and go into his hut without explaining anything. In some cases they go off and they ask some of the other monks for an explanation. But the Buddha can also be challenging them. How do you make sense out of this? How does this apply to you? It's in this quality of ingenuity that the Dharma really does become your own, and it solves your own problem. So that what you become as days and nights fly past is something you're proud to show to the Buddha. Because remember what kind of person he was. We've read his story. And he was a noble warrior in all senses of those words. 
There's a fierceness to his determination. And he wasn't the sort of person who would be blinded by people's hiding things. He could see right through people. So you wouldn't have an answer if that Buddha were ever to ask you. Days and nights of fly past, fly past. What are you becoming? You'd be able to give him an honest answer that you'd be proud to give.